eat over 10 billion pounds of it each year. It satiated the ancients and built modern day empires. From the equatorial fields into famous factories, from bonbons to bunnies, pods to peanut butter cups. At the heart of this giant industry is a little magic bean, believed to be an energizer, aphrodisiac, and cure-all. Now, chocolate on Modern Marvels. Bars, ice cream, cookies, cake, candy, Santas, hearts, bunnies, eggs, hollow, filled, hot, cold, solid, liquid, powder. Chocolate comes in many forms and has legions of fans. Annual sales in the U.S. top $16 billion and 75 billion worldwide. The average American consumes 12 pounds per year. The sweet-toothed Swiss, an astounding 22 pounds per person each year. Millions of people engage in the production of chocolate so that millions more can revel in their passion for it. One of the companies that capitalizes on this passion is Mars Incorporated, maker of M&Ms. Welcome to the M&Ms factory in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And all we make here is M&Ms. We have several varieties of M&Ms. We have uh, milk chocolate. We used to call it plain, but that seemed too simple. We have peanut, we have almond, and we have peanut butter and they produce several million of them per day. The process begins as milk chocolate is refined and blended for the optimal flavor, texture, and melting point. We've made the chocolate, now it's time to make the M&Ms, and this is the first step. The chocolate is being deposited on chilled rollers. Each of those rollers have dimples on them, so the chocolate's being pressed into it, and the output is a roll of dimples that go through a cooling tunnel and on into the next step of production. The cooled chocolate pellets are transferred to these giant rotating pans, where they roll against each other and start to take on the familiar shape prior to the application of the signature outer coating. Each of these pans hold about a thousand pounds, and what happens is that you start to see the beginning of an M&M. This is an opportunity for us to do a quality check. We're looking at the weight, we're looking at the size. As we go into the, uh, put on the sugar shell, you have to have a uniform M&M. A mixture made with liquid sucrose, cornstarch, and coloring is poured into the pans, enveloping each pellet as it hardens. Next, the sugar-coated candy travels to the printing area. Each piece sits snugly in its slot, passing under a printing roller, bearing the signature M in an edible white dye. Mars can even custom print your M&Ms, with everything from marriage proposals to the logo of your favorite TV network. Finally, individual conveyors carrying a single color of candy dump onto a central belt on the road to packaging. But no matter what's on the shelf, it's the chocolate inside that's the real treat. All chocolate starts life as a seed, or bean, inside the fruit of the cacao tree. There are three kinds of cocoa beans. There are the criollos that were originated in uh, near Venezuela and cultivated in Mesoamerica. The criollos have a, a very good flavor, but they may not be very um, sturdy, very uh, aggressive or resistant to diseases. Then we have the amazonicos or the forasteros that are very sturdy, very resistant, very highly productive. And there is a mixture of these two that is called Trinitarian. 
The cacao tree grows primarily in regions within 10 degrees north or south of the equator. It's a finicky plant that requires rich soil, steady rainfall, and tropical heat, but also shade from the tropical sun and shelter from the wind. It takes five to six months for the cacao pods to ripen, allowing for harvest twice a year. Here in Costa Rica and around the world, farmers harvest the pods by hand, a practice unchanged for over 2,000 years. Machines could damage the soil, delicate trees and pods. They put these pods in this pile and everybody sits around to break the pods. There you are. These are the beings and have this flesh this pulp, which is sweet and sour, very good for taste. You can eat it, you know, you can. The pulp may be sweet, but the beans inside are quite bitter. An experienced worker can crack open up to 500 pods an hour. Each pod will yield about 30 to 40 beans. Next, the beans need to ferment. If the farm isn't near a processing facility, workers use the traditional method of laying piles of beans between banana leaves to keep out dirt and rain and to insulate against heat loss. During the fermentation process, yeast metabolizes the sugars in the pulp, producing heat and ethanol as byproducts. Bacteria consume the ethanol and produce lactic and acetic acids. The alcohol and acids penetrate the shell and together with the heat, create a reaction that allows the cocoa flavor of the beans to develop and some of the bitterness to subside. After fermenting for about six days, the beans are ready to be dried in the sun. Bueno, este, aquí estamos secando cacao. Here we have the cacao beans drying in the sun. These have been drying for two days and need at least five more days to reach a moisture level of 7%. The advantage is that they will have a nice aroma and flavor. The less moisture in the beans, the less likely they are to grow mold during shipment. Dried beans are then scrutinized for quality, bagged and weighed. It takes roughly 1,600 to 1,700 pods, or 60,000 beans, to fill up a bag that can cost anywhere from $150 to $800. Now the sacks are ready to be shipped worldwide to chocolate manufacturers, like Guitard Chocolate in Burlingame, California. Guitard provides chocolate in bulk quantities to companies and professionals that will make the products we all crave. The products that uh, a lot of our customers make uh, are candy, bonbons, or your traditional truffle. Some people make candy bars. Fine restaurants will make ch chocolate uh, molten cakes and uh, mousses. Bakers they use our chocolate chips for making cookies. Guitard creates chocolate formulas unique to each type of product. And it all starts with the bean. Beans come to us from all over the world, from Africa, Central America, South America, and the Far East. And we select the flavors that we're interested in making for each specific chocolate. Each okay. region of the world produces a particular flavor. These beans are what we refer to as a raw agricultural commodity. Nobody on the face of the earth will ever put these into their mouth in this condition. They're dusty, there is stuff in them, and the first job is to clean these beans. The beans travel through a hopper to the cleaning area, where forced air, vibration, and then a vacuum will start to remove the foreign material. 
clean the beans, we come up to what we call the de-stoner. As the name implies, its job is to remove stones. Our milling equipment does not like rocks very much. It does a fair amount of damage, so this is critical. But there's one other piece. You have to remember that where beans are grown in the world are jungle conditions. This is a very wild place, including wild animals. You don't go out into the jungle unprotected. One of the things we pick up in this de is we also pick up live ammunition. We consider it really good form to remove all live ammo before we roast the cocoa beans for some fairly obvious reasons. The cleaned, unloaded beans are loaded into the roaster. The roasting process can take anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. From here, we have to remove the shell. So it goes into a machine we call the winnower, which breaks the bean apart, removes the shell, and we are left with a pure nib. This is the heart. This is what we're really after. The nibs are pre-milled into a coarse paste called chocolate liquor. Then onto the triple stone mill for finer grinding. The mill consists of three pairs of stone grinders. Coarse chocolate liquor is pumped to the first stone pair. The top stone rotates and grinds the liquor as it is forced toward the outer edges and collected. The mass flows down a chute to the next stone pair, where it's ground even finer. A third pass, and then out the bottom. The cocoa particle size is now one-sixth the diameter of a human hair. The resulting liquid chocolate liquor is divided. A portion goes to the cocoa press to have the cocoa butter literally squeezed out of it. Chocolate liquor is loaded into vertical pots inside the cocoa press. Using hydraulic pressure of up to 8,000 pounds PSI, the main ram slowly pushes pistons into each pot, compressing the liquor. Most of the fat is released and collected below, and you're left with cocoa powder cakes. We will grind it up and it will become cocoa powder that you use in baking a cake or some brownies at home. Then it's back to the other portion of chocolate liquor that hasn't had its fat removed. The liquor is combined with sugar or sugar and milk powder, depending on the desired end product. A series of steel rollers crushes and refines the thick mixture into a flaky substance. Then the conch, essentially a giant mixer, helps distribute the fat and develop the texture as the liquid ingredients are integrated. It typically will add somewhere around 28 to 32 pounds of lecithin for 10,000 pounds of chocolate. And then we'll add additional cocoa butter. The soy lecithin acts as an emulsifier, helping the wet and dry ingredients mix well. Incorporating the extra cocoa butter creates a less viscous blend that will make the chocolate creamier. From the conches, we're gonna to go to a set of tanks, and from the tanks, we send it to be deposited as 10-pound bars, as wafers, as cookie drops, or possibly not to be deposited at all, but to be sent out as a 50,000-pound liquid tanker full of chocolate. All this good stuff from processing a seed grown in the rainforest. This symbiosis of manpower and machine power has spawned an industry that satisfies a worldwide craving two millennia old. A craving born not just of taste, but of the basic desires for sex and money. In the average bag of milk chocolate M&Ms, you'll find 24% blue, 20% orange, 
16% green, 14% yellow, 13% red, and 13% brown colored candy shells. Chocolate will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. At Max Brenner Chocolate by the Bald Man in New York City, chocolate can be a refined affair or an all-out gluttonous free-for-all. Chocolate pizza, anyone? How about a syringe full of chocolate squirted right into your mouth? Dieters, beware. Max Brenner is creating a new chocolate culture. We use this very special food ingredient, chocolate, to give each person who comes here a very intimate and personal experience. Enjoy. Renner's personal chocophilia rivals that of historic fanatics. If we look many years backwards to the time of the Aztec, the king of the Aztec, who was like the god, he was allowed to eat this food because they said that it has uh, all these very unique virtues. Today, we can all be kings because we can all eat chocolate. The current state of chocoholism traces back to the Mesoamerican cultures. The classic Maya civilization of Central America and Southern Mexico and the Aztecs of Central Mexico, and possibly even as far back as the Olmec civilization. During ceremonies and celebrations, Maya and Aztec warriors, priests, and nobility drank a hot potion of ground roasted cocoa beans and water, to which spices were often added. They called the bitter drink, chocolatl. Soledad Lopez, of Aztec descent, uses old world tools and techniques to make chocolatl for her Los Angeles, California restaurant. We pick the, um, the best cacao uh, possible, and then after that, we have to get it and we roast it in the comal. After 20 minutes of slow roasting over charcoal, the Aztecs peeled the darkened beans and painstakingly ground them 20 separate times on a limestone matate. Usually, um, it takes about eight hours. And usually done only by women and little girls because it has to be very patient. The resulting thick paste was formed into measured cakes and set aside to dry. Three cakes are added per liter of hot water and then crushed with a wood molinillo. It was the frothy elixir of Aztec life and sometimes a taste of the bitter end. It had symbolic reference because the cacao pud is sort of the shape of a human heart. And uh, of course the Aztecs we know were enormously interested in heart extraction during sacrifices. They were also interested in chocolate as an aphrodisiac. Legend has it that Aztec ruler Montezuma consumed 50 goblets of chocolatl per day, usually right before he entered his harem. Which is ridiculous. Nobody could do that. It's a diuretic. He'd have to go to the bathroom very quickly um, because of the caffeine and, and uh, theobromine. In it. So maybe 50 goblets a day isn't historically accurate. But for centuries, people have believed that chocolate puts you in the mood and increases sexual stamina. It does contain chemicals that influence blood flow and certainly amorous activity and the redistribution of blood in the body go together. And there are chemicals in, in chocolate that likely improve mood as well. One of the likely candidates is an amino acid called tryptophan, which is the precursor to a chemical in the brain called serotonin, which enhances mood. In any case, cocoa was valuable. The Maya and Aztecs even used the beans as currency. A rabbit cost four to 30 beans, a mule, 50, a turkey or slave, 
100 beams. There is some debate over who brought cocoa beans and the recipe for chocolatl back to Spain in the 16th century. Columbus, Cortez, or Mayan emissaries. The Spanish added sugar to the bitter drink to appease their delicate palates. A big hit with the country's elite, chocolate was a jealously guarded secret. The secret was so well kept, in fact, that 16th century English pirates who captured a Spanish treasure ship were perplexed to find what looked like a cargo of dried sheep's droppings. They burned the entire ship in anger. Little did they know that in Spain, the beans were worth their weight in silver. It took nearly a century, but eventually the proverbial beans were spilled. And everyone in Europe went mad for sweet chocolate. To ensure a constant supply of sugar, and now cocoa, colonists built an ill-gotten labor force in the growing regions of Central America and the Caribbean. The native Indian peoples were dying off from introduced diseases. They simply weren't resistant to smallpox and uh, other terrible European or old world diseases. So they had a diminished labor force. To make up for this, they got into the African slave trade. And hundreds of thousands, eventually millions, of uh, Africans were torn out of Africa. Back in Europe, due to high import taxes, chocolate was hard on the wallet. And due to the high fat content in the beans, it was hard on the stomach, too. In 1828, a simple machine made it a bit easier to swallow and digest. The cocoa press squeezed about half of the natural fat from the cocoa solids. The resulting cake could be pulverized into a powder and added to water or milk. In 1847, uh, Mr. Fry in England was able to produce a first solid edible chocolate bar. Fry took the cocoa butter and added it with cocoa powder and sugar. This recipe eliminated water from the equation, allowing the product to harden. The bar was bitter and brittle by today's standards, but it was a start. Chocolate makers searched for ways to make the bars more palatable. The answer was milk, but it didn't mix well with the cocoa powder, cocoa butter combination. Because milk is nearly 90% water, it was kind of like mixing oil and water. In 1879, Swiss chocolatiers created the first milk chocolate by incorporating sweetened, evaporated milk. The 19th and early 20th centuries saw a huge chocolate boom, with today's familiar company names like Cadbury, Lindt, Hershey, and Mars coming into existence. The theobromine in chocolate is toxic to dogs, because they can't digest it as efficiently as humans. It can cause heart rhythm abnormalities, muscle tremors, seizures, and in large quantities, even death. Chocolate will return on Modern Marvels. We've been chocolate addicts since the very first bars hit stores in the mid 19th century. Today, one can find just about anything covered in chocolate. Fruit, nuts, nougat, pretzels, caramel, cookies, peanut butter, even worms and crickets. In the US, the undisputed kings of covering stuff in chocolate are Hershey and Mars. To make its signature Hershey bars and Hershey bars with almonds, Hershey blends sugar, milk, cocoa butter, chocolate liquor, lecithin, and vanilla. The chocolate mixture is then heated, cooled, and agitated in a process known as tempering. Similar to glass or metal tempering, 
This will ensure that the chocolate solidifies properly. What that means is that we'll have a good shine, it will be hard, and the appearance will last longer. So the milk chocolate is brought over to this area and then is deposited into molds. When making almond bars, Hershey carefully controls the number of nut pieces, depositing about seven almonds in each. The bars are cooled for about 20 to 30 minutes and sent to the packaging area. About 1.9 million bars come off these lines per day. And of course, there are the Hershey Kisses. And those decadent Reese's peanut butter cups. The multi-billion dollar company of today was started in 1894 by an American innovator determined to bring Europe's best to the folks at home. Milton Hershey was aware of the Swiss milk chocolate, so very soon he began experimenting with trying to make milk chocolate. After a few years, he had an edible product that he introduced in 1900. When he was developing his formula and was assured of the success, he began construction of a major new chocolate manufacturing plant here in what is today Hershey, Pennsylvania. Over a century later, Hershey is synonymous with chocolate. Hershey's most formidable foe was founded in Tacoma, Washington by Frank and Ethel Mars. The Mars Corporation started in 1911, Frank Mars making candy in his kitchen. He was very successful and moved to Chicago and built a factory there in 1929, right when the Depression started. But still, he was able to be successful. Frank Mars created the Milky Way Bar in 1923. Malt-flavored nougat and caramel enrobed in milk chocolate. Mars added peanuts to nougat and caramel in 1930. The result became one of the most popular candy bars, Snickers, with $2 billion in annual retail sales. Frank's son, Forrest, continued the family's candy-making tradition and left his own footprint on chocolate history. While on a trip to Spain during the Spanish Civil War, Forrest encountered soldiers eating pellets of chocolate encased in a hard shell that kept the candy solid in hot weather. In 1941, he introduced M&Ms, ironically made with chocolate supplied by Hershey. By the late 1940s, M&Ms joined the ranks of American chocolate success stories. Because the melting point of cocoa butter is just below body temperature, the candy coating is applied as a barrier to ensure that M&Ms will always melt in your mouth, not in your hand. M&Ms, Snickers, and Hershey bars represent just a fraction of the world's demand for chocolate. To meet that craving, about 3.3 million tons of cocoa are harvested annually. But that supply is constantly threatened. Cacao trees can easily fall prey to a number of fungal diseases that have plagued the crop for years. The major problems are moniliasis and witch's broom diseases. This spot is infected by monilia. It produces a lesion. A square centimeter of lesion is able to produce uh, 44 millions of spores. One spore could equal one lost pod. Do the math. The effects are devastating. In the early 1980s, Monilia pod rot decimated three quarters of Costa Rica's cocoa crop. If a disease of this magnitude hit the major producing region of West Africa, we could expect to pay a lot more for that Hershey bar. Geneticists and agroforesters at the Cartier Research Facility in Turrialba, Costa Rica are striving to make sure this doesn't happen. In association with the member-funded World Cocoa Foundation, these researchers are developing sturdier cocoa plants 
that will ultimately benefit everyone. There's an international cooperation between industry organizations, universities, research institutes, and governments in, involved in the producing new hybrids, finding new ways to fight pests and diseases, and then taking all of that scientific research and knowledge out to the fields to 40 to 50 million people who grow cocoa around the world. Alfred Hitchcock used Bosco chocolate syrup to simulate blood during the famous shower scene in his 1960 thriller, Psycho. Chocolate will return on Modern Marvels. Chocolate can taste especially great when wrapped around other stuff that tastes great. For the everyman, perhaps a peanut butter cup. For the connoisseur, a fine handmade truffle. Traditionally a soft chocolate center, coated in hard chocolate or cocoa powder. But the frugal aficionado can split the difference and buy truffles expertly mass-produced by Lindt and Sprungli. We see Lindt as a daily affordable luxury. We don't believe that uh, good chocolate is only uh, uh, designed or made for uh, certain consumers. We believe that everybody deserves to experience the ultimate chocolate experience. Lind fastidiously controls the entire process in a manner worthy of the Swiss, the world's heaviest consumers of chocolate. We select the finest chocolate beans, predominantly the Criollo bean, which is the best flavor bean, and we grind them, roast them, process them in a dedicated plant in Switzerland and we ship out the chocolate mass in a one metric ton block, 2,200 pounds of solid chocolate mass to the manufacturing facilities. Lind Stratham, New Hampshire plant makes the famous Lindor truffles, about 5.8 million of them per day. The mammoth block of Swiss made chocolate liquor is hoisted into the liquor melter where a series of 180-degree water-heated stainless steel rollers gently liquefy the solid mass. After nearly two hours, the product is ready to be combined with the dry ingredients, including sugar and milk powder, and then refined. We're putting together the ingredients here at the recipe tower. As we move down through this room, we're going to gradually reduce the particle size of the mix. At this point, the uh, recipe is roughly 200 microns. It has roughly the uh, consistency of a brownie mix. When we get done at the end of that process, we'll be in the 14 to 16 micron range. That's a range at which your mouth can no longer detect the particle size of the uh, chocolate, which is really what differentiates premium chocolate from regular chocolate. Next, time for the conching where the chocolate is gently rolled and blended for several hours to a smooth consistency. A process stumbled upon by this company's founder back in 1879. While experimenting with chocolate blending techniques in his shop, Rudolf Lindt took off for a hunting weekend and accidentally forgot to shut off his mechanical rolling machine. He returned to find his chocolate had a velvety texture and a flavor superior to previous incarnations. The modern day conch has evolved into the workhorse of any chocolate factory. In the past, it was uh, with water mills driven. Later on, it was driven with steam engine. Today, we have machines with the capacity from 13,000 pounds and with a huge, powerful motor that can create up to 1800 RPMs and everything is computer controlled. The temperatures are controlled, the speed is controlled, you can run clockwise, you can run anti-clockwise, you add in cocoa butter in, you have about 20 to 30 different steps in the inside of the conch. After conching, the chocolate is molded into hollow orbs. We're filling one half of the mold set 
with chocolate. We're putting on the top half of the mold set, and then we're going through a series of three rotations, gently swirling the chocolate around the inside of the mold cavity. And by doing so, we're creating a hollow sphere. Once the shells have cooled and hardened, in goes the filling. Topped off with a dab of chocolate to make sure nothing leaks out. What makes the secret chocolate filling recipe unique is that Lint has found a way to lower its melting point, creating a cooling sensation in your mouth. Lindor truffles may taste expensive, but Lint's ability to mass produce them ensures that premium chocolate won't send you to the poorhouse. Good thing, too, because there's about to be a mad rush for chocolate. It's been several hundred years, but real chocoholism is back. Not the candy store kind, but the Aztec obsession kind, minus the human sacrifices. The future for chocolate will come from its past. We're really trying to understand the history. We're trying to understand the agronomy. We're trying to understand the molecular chemistry, uh, the genes of, the, of cocoa. True chocolate lovers are searching out fine flavor chocolate made with high quality beans. And they're learning about origin cocoa. Cocoa from Madagascar tastes different than cocoa from uh, Ecuador. They're looking at percentages on cocoa on the bars that they buy. The percentage noted on chocolate products refers to the amount of chocolate liquor, plus any added cocoa butter. From a medical perspective, dark chocolate, 60% and higher, is all the rage. Step aside, spinach. There's a new health food in town. There's more and more evidence of late that dark chocolate is one of those rare foods that is a great indulgence that's actually good for us. Dark chocolate is the most concentrated source of antioxidants readily available to us in our diets. More concentrated than green tea, more concentrated than virtually all fruits and vegetables. And in particular, the family of antioxidants concentrated in dark chocolate called flavonoids are associated with reduced risk of heart disease, reduced risk of injury to blood vessels, reduced risk of diabetes, reduced risk of stroke, reduced risk of cancer, so is dark chocolate really a miracle food? Too much of even a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. And uh, we know in medicine that the dose makes the poison. And chocolate, for all of its beneficial health effects, it's a concentrated source of calories. Consider the health benefits icing on the chocolate cake. Because good for you or not, people will continue their love affair with chocolate, especially during the holidays. According to Forbes magazine, the world's most expensive chocolate truffle, hand-rolled by Knipschilt of Norwalk, Connecticut, retails for $250 per piece. Chocolate will return on Modern Marvels. For chocolate lovers, any time is a good time. Especially holiday time. Easter, Christmas, and don't be caught dead without some on Valentine's Day. If it's not a Hershey or Mars product, odds are you're enjoying something made of the R.M. Palmer Company of Reading, Pennsylvania, the number one producer of holiday chocolate treats for over half a century. Take Easter. Each year, the R.M. Palmer Company makes about 200 million chocolate Easter bunnies in all shapes and sizes. Both the chocolate Easter bunny and the chocolate egg go back to Germany in the 1700s. The bunny and the egg symbolize uh, fertility. And spring, as we know, is the rebirth of nature and everything that goes with it. So the Germans dis associated these two icons with Easter. To capitalize on the craze, R.M. Palmer Sr. devised a way to make hollow chocolate Easter bunnies with an unusual ingredient. Personality.
Our company was started by my father, Richard Palmer Sr., in 1948. At that time, all bunnies were more or less traditional. They looked like this. We made them look like this, which is more of a cartoon version. This was our first product in 1948, and actually, it's still in the line today. This bunny and I are exactly the same age. As a matter of fact, we have exactly the same amount of hair. The first Palmer bunnies were molded on a machine designed by the company founder himself. And it's still going strong. We're looking at line one here at the RM Palmer Company. We put a polycarbonate mold into the line. We heat it to about 90 to 95 degrees to ensure that it has a proper release point. The chocolate's deposited around 84 to 85 degrees, depending on the product. We also have to ensure that we have the right viscosity so we get the proper wall thickness. The amount of chocolate deposited is just enough to coat the walls. The molds rotate a total of 60 times per bunny cycle to ensure the chocolate is distributed evenly throughout the cavity, leaving a perfect hollow center. These long-eared big boys are ready to receive their personas. And if you've ever wondered... All of our hollow chocolate bunnies have eyes. The eyes could be yellow, they could be white, they could be blue, they could be pink. Most of them, the traditional ones, are made out of an icing material, which is basically water, sugar, and egg albumin. A contemporary cousin of Line 1, Line 10, produces small bunnies by the Army. It looks pretty simple. Mold goes under depositor. Depositor pours chocolate into mold. Not quite. On line 10, it's what you don't see that makes these bunnies so popular. This line actually has the capability of producing almost 80,000 pounds a day. Today alone, we will make almost 4 million bunnies coming off of this line, and they're all filled with peanut butter. A pipe carrying chocolate and a pipe carrying peanut butter meet at the depositor, where a central pipe ends in a nozzle inside a nozzle. The chocolate ejects a hair of a second before the peanut butter and continues for a fraction of a second thereafter. This allows the chocolate to fully encapsulate the peanut butter in the center. First thing you've got to ensure is that the material has the same density and the same viscosity characteristics so that they have the correct flow properties. After that is strictly mathematics with piston diameter as well as the channeling inside the nozzle plate. Those techniques will ensure a perfect peanut butter center, or as we call a one-shot center, in each and every little bunny. Whether you enjoy them hollow or filled, everyone knows which part to chomp first. In fact, 76% of us go straight for the ears. The experts at Palmer think they know why. The reason is probably that in the process of making a hollow bunny, more chocolate goes to the ears than goes to the rest of the bunny. So real chocolate lovers would therefore gravitate to the ears, just like this. Mmm. All right. So be it bunny or trouble, milk or dark, solid or liquid, chocolate producers continue to crank out the good stuff. Maybe that's because manufacturers, like most everyone else, love their chocolate too and a nice flavor it's the kind of flavor that you put a piece of chocolate in your mouth